Welcome to episode 88 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Dad Talk, and I've invited Brian Fox to have a chat. What's this series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot, or even none at all. This series is all about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. And that means you may hear some dads discuss ideas that you disagree with. That's okay. Their voice is important, and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Brian and I discuss peaceful parenting. Regular supporters of the show might recall that I recently had Davey Parrish on to speak on the same topic. Brian brings a slightly different perspective, which includes his religious faith. And with that, let's dive right in and hear what he has to say. All right. Thank you, Brian, for being on the Liberty Dad podcast, the Dad Talk series. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Awesome. It's great to have you on. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about your perspective on peaceful parenting. You will actually be the second person uh, because I got sick. I did not get my previous episode out with Davey Parrish, who actually was able to come here actually in studio. And we had a conversation and he brought his son and his son and my son, they got along ma- ma- like just like magic. It was it was amazing how great they got along. I was really excited. Um, I, I don't think I ever realized how excited I would get to watch my kid play with another kid. <laughs> you know, but I, I my son had never been around his son, so I didn't know. Like, you know, and sometimes I'll, kids don't gel. But, uh, his son is four. My son is almost three. Yeah, there there can be potential conflict there. So, but usually at that age, they're pretty much open to anybody. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, they hit it off like, uh, and it was funny later on. I took a look at his room downstairs. He's got like this little playroom downstairs, and I went in and I looked, and I was like, "Holy wow, they really did have fun." And I oh took, yeah. I took a pet a picture and I sent it to Davy Paris, and I was like, "Dude, they really did have fun." And he, he was like, oh, man, I wish I would have known. He said, my son's cleanup game is really good. And I was like, ah, there'll be plenty of time for that. Like, there's no rush, I guess. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about peaceful parenting from your perspective. You're coming from a slightly different angle, from a more religious angle. So are you a so let's first dive in and say, who is Brian Fox? So tell us a little bit about you in general, just whatever it is that you think we should know about. So yes, uh, I'm Brian Fox, and I grew up in the Midwest in uh, Nebraska, and then I moved to Florida when I was a teenager. Um, very conservative uh, Christian background overall. Um, grew up uh, watching the news with my grandpa, hearing my grandpa comment about the news, which is what really initially piqued interest in current events and being aware of the world around me. Right. Um, I would say that I uh, definitely was raised in a community that was very heavily uh, Republican. Um, I'd heard of the Democrats, but pretty much only knew about what people had said about them mm-hmm. and didn't know anything else. So I only knew from the Republican point of view, you know, the perspective on life in general. So I grew up a big government Republican without even realizing it. I just kind of figured that Republicans were right and everybody else was wrong. Right. Uh, was pre-internet so I had no idea about any perspectives outside my own and anytime I would encounter somebody outside of my circle it seemed very odd to me right so uh and then of course when we moved to Florida in the uh, late 80s and early 90s there's a lot more people out there that aren't quite conservative Christians Mm -hmm. so of course I'm people from different perspectives and I wasn't really sure what to make of them because I wasn't really told about that so I joined the military and um, I'm in the military in the 90s. And then uh, I'm here in Kentucky at my last duty station at Fort Knox uh, when 9-11 happens. Okay. And 9-11 happens, me being a soldier, I'm like, you know, wow, this is it. This is what we're all about. This is the big game. And, you know, we've got to, you know, take the battle to the enemy, just like they always said. So I was uh, very much big on the uh, war on terror. And uh, I I really felt that that was a a noble effort. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot 
the internet forums happened in the early 2000s, you know, got online, started chatting with people. And uh, I would say it was very early on that I started encountering people that were talking about ideas I'd never heard before. Uh, drug legalization, uh, gay marriage, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of things that uh, were not openly talked about in the conservative uh, circles that I grew up in. Right. Oddly enough, um, I was never antagonistic to gay marriage. It never really triggered me. It seemed controversial because of the people's reactions around me, but I personally never really took issue with it. I didn't agree with it, but I was like, I had no problem with it either. Right. Um, what really triggered me the most towards the liberty path was having a conversation with somebody online about marijuana legalization. And I thought I'd gotten this guy while well, I was thinking, well, if you're going to legalize marijuana, well, then certainly you should. Uh, what do you want to do? You want to legalize all the drugs? And he's like, absolutely. And it actually made perfectly consistent sense. Right. And it you know, kind of shocked me. I was like, wow, that's consistent and logical. And I understand and I, I can wrap my head around that. Right. So that was gateway a little bit between that and gay marriage. Those were kind of my gateways to understanding the liberty perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a journey. It took several years um, of a lot of exposure to a lot of different ideas and concepts that, again, I'd never heard before, but I was very curious about, you know, hearing people challenge the military and the war effort really shocked me because, you know, of course, I'm a veteran. And at that time, you know, I kind of felt like anybody that wasn't supporting the war, the military was very unpatriotic. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot for me to work through, needless to say. And uh it took me several years to finally come in around to a lot of the li basic libertarian concepts um, simply because I was coming from a very dead set, big government Republican point of view, but mm -hmm. I was also minded and curious, which is, I think is what really helped me the most. I think that's, if it wasn't for the fact that I was very open-minded and willing to consider I don't think I would have made that transition in the sense that in the truest sense of I was very stubborn, but I was very curious. So I had a lot of friends that were very patient with me and they helped me along the way. One in particular was a fellow by the name of David Hines, who's a board member of the LPMC. Mm -hmm. He's actually that helped me understand the nap. We actually had okay. a good video conversation in which he explained to me how that works. And so ever since then, I've, you know, I didn't actually, I became a libertarian at that point, but I didn't truly fully embrace anarchy until a few years later. But that was really the biggest crossroads. That was the threshold for me to overcome to really embrace liberty. Gotcha. So since we're talking about um, a, a peaceful parenting, my experience is not all that different. And I'll swing back to that in just a moment, just to kind of give you a feel for where I am, because I don't really talk about it a lot, no particular reason. I just, it just doesn't really come up a lot. Um, but my, it's, it's really funny. I find that there's a lot of people who are, you know, what they call the Rand Paul libertarians, the, the ones that got motivated by Rand Paul. And I actually wasn't terribly familiar with, uh, I mean, I knew who he was, but I wasn't familiar with um, the the impact that he's had on the Liberty movement until after I got into the Liberty movement, I kept hearing people talk about it. So I came, you know, you mentioned a, a couple of topics that kind of brought you in um, or that were kind of like your gateways. Uh, one of them being the military. And then I forgot, oh, what, what did I, I um, thought I had wrote it down, but you had mentioned another topic that kind of, that kind of were kind of like the topics that kind of pushed you in that general direction. And it was funny because the uh, I think the first topic for me was uh, and don't laugh or or do uh, it was prostitution, and but it wasn't for partaking in it. It was just I don't remember what got me thinking, but I I know that when, there was a time a long time ago in my first marriage where I was listening to a lot of talk news, like a lot of talk radio, and so I would just listen to them. I was listening to like Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and other people along that line local and more national level. And I remember I came home one time and I was talking to my ex-wife and I was like, it's not why she's my ex-wife, by the way, but and I said, prostitution should be legal. <laughs> like, this is like unprompted, un, you know, like out of nowhere, just 
you know, like you come home and you're like, hey, honey, you know, I had this, had this thought, you know, prostitution should be legal. And we were both very much the Midwestern conservative evangelical types. And she got really upset. And so there was a little bit of an argument. And so I was like, finally, I realized what she heard was something more like prostitution should be legal because I might like to try it out. <laughs> and so once I started backpedaling a little bit and saying like, look, I, I don't think that it's necessarily a good idea. I just think that that's not the government's role to dictate because the only difference between going out and meeting a woman at a bar and, you know, having some, you know, some drinks with her and talking and going home and a prostitute is the exchange of money. Like that is literally the only difference. Right. And I think that kind of started me down the path. Uh, oh, um, same sex marriage. That was the other one that you, you, you mentioned. And so that one also was for me because as an evangelical, we were very much opposed to same sex marriage. And one of the things that I remember about the evangelical community is that it was always like, oh, you know, we can't have it because we'll become Sodom and Gomorrah kind of attitude, right? Like all these bad things are going to happen. But nobody ever really specifically said exactly what bad things are going to happen and like how, like how will the impact of this over here occur over here, right? And so I started questioning things um, just by saying like, you haven't really made this connection, actually. Um, and maybe it's not nearly as bad as you think, right? Like, you, you know, it, I mean, maybe it is, you know, this is, this is my position at the time. I was just like, well, maybe it is, but it hasn't been described. So saying all that, a similar background, I was also in the military when 9-11 hit, you know, I, I was actually in the National Guard. We were training to go to Bosnia. I was going to go on a six-month tour um, you know, over in Bosnia doing, uh, with, uh, peacekeeping force. And, um, you know, and I called him up and I'm like, oh man, are we going, we, we shifting gears, you know, like it was a big thing. So, you know, very similar. I feel like when I hear your story, I'm like, you know what, I can, I can relate to a lot of that. So another thing that I think, you know, on the, on the conversation tonight is in the conservative circles that I was always in, there wasn't really this peaceful parenting attitude. It was more of a, we need to whoop their ass, right? Kind of attitude. And I mean, it wasn't as bad as sometimes what I see online. I see some stuff online and I'm like, are you sure your people are okay? Like, like, like I don't remember growing up with that strong of a feeling about it, um, you, you know, like, or, or the people that are around me. So where, how did you move into the idea? Cause I'm assuming, and tell me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming you share that where you, you had a, 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 a you didn't grow up in the peaceful parenting movement. So you, you moved into it. I will say that um, I did definitely did not grow up into it. I was definitely raised in a culture where getting your ass beat was considered a sort of necessary step for discipline. Right. And I will say that I think that when it comes to our approach to peaceful parenting, or at least for the most part, because I will say, I, I think that there's a caveat to that from where I'm coming from. It, uh, it actually parlays into the whole idea of why we're libertarians in the first place. Mm -hmm. Instead of acting with force, we need to be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it comes to peaceful parenting is, you know, one of the best things I ever heard growing up about how to raise children is treat them like adults from a very early age. Mm -hmm. You talk to them like an adult and help them reason like an adult. They will actually grow more healthy and more able to think for themselves as opposed to if you just tell them what to do and treat them like a child. Right. And so I really start with, uh, I've got two boys, 16 and nine years old. Mm -hmm. and, um, I would never qualify myself as someone who was just ready and prepared to embrace fatherhood. I was always a very selfish young man growing up. Mm -hmm. I have very tendencies and I can be very reactive. So I would not consider myself to be the type of person that would be ideal for a parent. However, I understood a couple of things. One, I understood that, you know, you have to consider the person that you're dealing with, the child that you're raising, and you have to have a desire for them to do, to become better than you. And so right. with that in mind, I 
I will say that when I initially started off with my oldest, I wasn't the most prepared and I wasn't the most thoughtful. It took me a few years to kind of pick up on it Mm -hmm. and realize that it was a progression of uh, adapting the military lifestyle that I needed growing up. I had a lack of discipline. So I Mm -hmm. automatically, my kid needed, but then over time I realized, wow, my kid's a really smart person. He does very well to observe and listen to what I'm saying and doing maybe he, I will get a better response out of him if I reason with him and if right. I walk the expectations and why. And oddly enough, sure as shit, it worked. Huh. I got a response out of my kid after treating him like an adult, after talking to him like an adult and realizing that I get more dividends out of him from getting him to understand my expectations as opposed to just simply laying them on him and expecting him to follow through regardless of his understanding. Right. And what, what Um, age did you start that? Did it really kick in? I guess I would say probably didn't start that effectively until he was about nine or 10 years old. Okay. To be, but but did you start Um, it earlier? Um, as far as, so I didn't the effort of saying, Hey, I'm going to, to, to use a different approach than what is often, you know, presumed. So I was talking to him from the early years, but in terms of the discipline, I know that took a little bit of longer progression after it was only after I realized I wasn't getting the results that I was expecting. Right. He was, he was always a very smart kid from an early on. So I could always talk to him and get him to understand things, but I noticed I wasn't getting the results. Right. And a lot of, I was applying the sort of military discipline approach of barking orders, uh, intimidation, that sort of thing. Things that I probably needed more of growing up right. in a certain than he did. He didn't need that. He just mm-hmm. needed someone to educate him and to set barriers and boundaries. Right. And so I did establish those boundaries and walk him through the logic and then the understanding the results were completely different. And so I will say that I absolutely believe in the principle of, you know, ensuring that your kids know what you're talking about and understand why your expectations that you have set for them are of uh, incredible value. I think when it comes to the deviation is that I do believe that when children are younger, before they're able to reason, there are certain time frames in which I do believe that a spanking or at least maybe a slap on the bus, slap on the wrist, something of a quick physical response to concerns of disrespect or danger for set mm-hmm. for matter are, are appropriate. Um, scripture says the spare the rod to spoil the child. The context behind that is that when a child is young, a child cannot reason, or if a child is in a fit of rage, a child will not be able to reason. Right. And so there are instances in which you need to get their attention. You need to get them to snap out of it. We're simply just talking to them and saying, hey, look, we're going to just sit here and we're going to walk through this and talk about this. They're not going to listen to you because they're very emotional. They're, you're, they're right. pushing you. So by a little, you know, I don't advocate for beating the crap out of your kid. I certainly right. don't advocate for um, heavy handed violence of any kind. Um, I think it has to be measured and thoughtful and appropriate for the situation and more or less to get their attention than anything else. Right. Uh, I will say that the way that my grandfather spanked me, I will never do to my kids. and I never did do to my kids. Right. But a couple of times where I did spank my youngest on the butt and, you know, I did get his attention and then eventually... Right as he was more able to reason and understand what I'm telling him and the instruction I'm giving him, it was no longer an issue. I no longer had to do that. Right. It's interesting. Um, you know, so I grew up getting spankings like every day. I was, I was a pretty wild child. I mean, some of the stories that my mom and dad would tell me, they, they'd finish telling the story and I'd go, you making that up? Cause that sounds pretty wild eyed, you know? And, um, and then, you know, my aunt and other people in the family that, you know, grew up with me, they would be like, no, no, that's, that's totally true. That exactly happened. And, um, uh, but my brother and my sister, my sister is tw- uh, six years younger than me. My brother's 12 years younger than me. They got one spanking ever that I can remember each. 
like one, literally. And um, it's debatable whether they even really, quote, needed that, right? Uh, but I remember my mom would do things with my little brother, and she would say stuff like, Joe, do you need a spanking or a hug? And, I'm, and he, would, he, would, he would sit there and be like, and I'm like, dude, what are you, what are you, what are you thinking about? What is there to think about here in this particular situation? Like, seriously. And then he would say something. And my, my little brother, like, we're talking like when he was like nine or something, right? So we're not talking like when he's 17 and he's got a lot of reasoning skills behind him. We're talking about when he's like eight or nine and, you know, they're, they're growing, but they're, they're, they're certainly not there in any significant capacity. And he would say, well, mom. I probably need a spanking, but I would sure like a hug. <laughs> I'm like, and then of course that's what he would get. Uh, he would get a hug, and 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 you know, it, but he was also the kind of kid that would tell on himself out of nowhere. Like he would just, you know, you're, everybody's sitting there watching TV, and he would be like, "I'm sorry, mom, I, I ate cookies when I wasn't supposed to." And I'm like, "Dude, nobody was, nobody even knew the cookies were missing." No, stop, stop, you know. So my, my, you know, so that's where I kind of came face to face with this idea, like you were mentioning a moment ago, that um, kids are different, you know, like what I needed um, doesn't appear at all to be what my son needs. And, you, you know, and, and he doesn't seem at, I mean, I don't know how I responded. I think I don't, I don't think I responded very well. So there's probably some argument to be made that my mom chose, you know, a, a not so effective method of discipline and punishment, right? Um, I don't know, I'd have to talk to her and find out like, hey, did it at least get you what you wanted, at least in the moment? Um, we know it didn't in long, you know, it, it didn't until long term. You know, once I got much, much, much older, things changed, but I was constantly getting in trouble. So, so clearly, in one particular sense, it didn't, it didn't, didn't provide, you know, that, that, that shift in the way I was thinking and the way I was approaching stuff. But, um, you know, I, I came, you know, that, that, like, that's kind of like that first, you, you, you know, my, my little, my, my, my son doesn't seem to have that approach. Like he's very, he's an extremely good kid, although he can throw down. And when he throws down, like, there's really not a whole lot to do. Like you just, I, I, like I'll literally take him into his like playroom. Most of our house is tile because we live in Florida, but there's a playroom that has a uh, carpet. And I'll, if he's throwing a big fit, I'll take him in there and then just leave and close the door and let him throw a fit. And then sometimes I'm here and stuff and, I, and I'll open the door and I'm like, I mean, he doesn't really understand, but I'm like, you start breaking toys and they get, they're going to get thrown away. I'm like, we're not going to have any broken toys, you know? Uh, but we just kind of let him like work it out. And then he comes out. And he's all like, you know, he'll have something in his hand. He's like, hi, daddy, pen. I got a pen. I'm going to do some drawing. And I'm like, okay, we'll go with it. <laughs> so he's definitely very different from what I remember hearing my stories about me. I definitely can relate to that. And I think you're touching on a key point is uh, it's the idea of when I would say spanking is ever warranted, it's for the same reasons that you just mentioned in terms of getting the child's attention to get them to de-escalate from the state of mind that they're currently in where they're worked up and they're not thinking straight. And right. I think that's the pivot right there is I don't think any child is ever um, wanting to be punished or is ever truly reckless in the sense of they are so sinister that they right. are plot behavior. I do. It feels like it sometimes. Well, I'll qualify that by <laughs> children are sinful you know we're sinful from childhood sure. and that, that if you watch and observe kids they know what they're doing from an early age they understand right from wrong they'll test right. the bound right but i think within what you touched on which is key is getting their attention right. getting them to slow down just enough to consider the situation right. and then you know about which path they want to take next right. now from you the spanking, the slapping, whatever it is, the physical involvement is only to get their attention in the moment. And it just depends on the context. Again, it could be disrespect. It could be a safety or a danger sort of an issue. Mm -hmm. It's not to, oh, you ate chocolate cookies and when you weren't supposed to, okay, now you're going to get a spanking. I don't right. agree with that. 
Right. It would only be very limited context because I do believe that when you start hitting kids for the wrong reasons, you are reinforcing a bad behavior of violence, you know, to justify right and wrong. And I don't agree with that either. I do right. believe that, you know, get a child to be able to reason and understand and violence does not necessarily promote that, that I'm aware of. I'm not an expert on the field. So I will just say that in a limited sort of way of applying a spanking or a slap on the wrist, it has its purpose, but it's very limited and it has to be thoughtful. And it, I will also say it has to be coupled with a demonstration of love and concern. You sure. can't just thank your kid and then walk away and expect your kid to know what's going on or to benefit from right. why did, you know, it's like, you have to have a conversation with them. You have to kind of talk to them and walk them through it in whatever terms that you can mm -hmm. to get them to. I think at that point, if you can make that connection, then you've succeeded and hopefully the spankings or the discipline will decrease over time because you get enough of those eventually it's going to kick in and they're going to realize, Oh, wow, this isn't, the, I know what's going to happen if I do such and such. Right. So, you know, I haven't had to hit my kids a whole lot. And in fact, I can say that I can't recall off the top of my head, the last time I ever had to spank either of my kids when they were growing up, I did it so infrequently. It was not very common. Right. Now what I will this there were times when I lost my cool on my kids and I yelled at them. And to be right. honest with you, I have bigger regrets about losing my temper than any time whenever I might've spanked them because right. I kind of feel like in that context, can you imagine being a child and then having your father with a deep booming voice express such anger and, and disappointment to you? Can you imagine how that would feel? Right. I remember having, grandfather yell at me and how that made me feel and that reminds me that you have to be you have to be very careful in how you approach your kids and what kind of an example and what kind of a message you're trying to set for them right um, for my kids I've always been very mindful that I want them to learn from my mistakes and to be better off than I was I want them to be very thoughtful mm -hmm. and I want them very considerate of others around them. And so whenever there was a mistake made, whenever a, a, a choice was made that was very bad, you know, other than just simply telling them no or getting upset, I had to have that little quick little chat with them and say, right. do you know what's wrong? Do you understand the problem here? And right. so my wife would even accuse me of giving too many lectures, but that's <laughs> what worked. That's what worked for me. I had right people in my life that would explain things to me. So yeah, I tend to be a little bit long winded and sometimes explaining things. Right. Although I that with my oldest, he's pretty smart, can take things at face value. And I only have to tell him briefly once he picks right. up on it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. I'm not a big, so I have a little bit different perspective in, in the whole hitting area. I know a lot of people, and, and you share it, you share a similar view that I've heard from others where they're like, you know, I think it's better, you know, we don't want to teach violence and stuff like that. And I'm coming from a, I guess maybe a more rudimentary perspective. And I just say, I don't really think it's necessarily effective or necessary. And I think I look at spanking, you know, physical discipline as a crude tool. Um, and if you can use another tool, you are better off. And I actually, I, I don't, I don't even like the idea of yelling at my son, although it does happen, but I don't like the idea of even yelling at him because I'm like, that's just not the experience that I want to have with him, right? Like I, I want to have a pleasant experience. I know that there are going to be times where um, it may not be pleasant, right? He's going to, he's going to be emotional and just, you know, flip out because his ice cream is too short or something. I don't know, whatever, you know, stuff, stuff that happens when you're a toddler and you just kind of you know, for whatever reason, you just kind of lose, lose it. And, and so that those will be some unpleasant times. Um, but then also the other thing that I've really put a lot of thought into is I think people, you know, I think people forget what it's like to be a kid. And, and it's very easy. I mean, I'm 43, I'm almost 44. So the idea of remembering what it was like to be three, it, it, it doesn't even exist. 
but I, 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 I approach it and say, there's a lot of things that he's going to do that I'm not going to particularly like, but they're very normal little, they're, they're very normal things for a little boy to do. So like we give him crayons and of course I want him to draw only in his coloring books, only on a piece of paper that I give him, but he will find a book that maybe I'm reading that I left laying around somewhere, or maybe he'll find a wall and he will draw on it. So I start, you know, I kind of come from this approach where I say, I'm, ex I, I'm not excited that he's doing it. I don't want him to do it. But at the same time, that's not really out of the ordinary. So there's no reason for me to get upset about it, right? Like, why would you get mad for a little boy doing a little boy thing, you know? Are you, it would uh, be, a, I mean, so I'm definitely not a proponent of just spanking just to enforce rules. Right, yeah, same here. Very limited, yeah. con like, I, like I try, I think I'm, and I want to do again to reiterate, I think it has a very limited context in which I believe that it's appropriate. It's not appropriate as a means of saying, well, you drew outside the lines or you had cookies when you weren't right. supposed to. Things of that nature, you know, that's parenting 101 where you just have to do better to be more consistent right. and outline and reinforce boundaries. Right. For me, whenever you do have to use physical force, again, from my perspective, from the scriptural perspective and from the conversations that I've had with people that have gone through parenting from a scriptural perspective, it's really in a limited context of getting someone's attention in the moment right. to reinforce right. bound. It's not yeah. meant to say, we're going to just smack you anytime you're out of line. That's right. not appropriate. I think I would say that that's child abuse. Um, gotcha. What I'm thinking is if you catch your child, playing with something that is very dangerous that they don't have permission to play with then you and they're they're at the point to where perhaps they could hurt themselves right you know a, a quick pop on the hand you know not a slap on the hand but a pop on the hand gets their attention right say they're like a banshee with friends and they happen to pick up something that is very dangerous that could be used without in, intentionally understanding otherwise right right very dangerous their friends you know you have to stop them in their tracks in that moment to get their attention to right. understand that now again i was very fortunate that i don't think i had to do it very often like i said i can't even recall ever doing right. it. i know i did times um i will say in retrospect more so than not it was a matter of was my anger tempered and i would imagine that most parents that spank routinely are doing so more out of an outburst of anger from not being able to use better parenting skills right. to deal with it. And I think that's where I draw the line is I don't agree right. with that. Yeah. I think that's parenting. I think that's people who are just going by what they've learned and what, you know, honestly, a society that teaches, you know, it's okay to beat the shit out of your kid to get their attention. I don't right. agree with that. Right. And, and, so and, and that's kind of what drove me because I was like, you know, I, you know, cause when I was younger, I mean, I'm 43 now. So when I was in my twenties, if you had asked me, I wasn't a libertarian and I was definitely a conservative for sure. And I don't mean to pin, you know, like conservatives beat their kids and libertarians don't. Uh, I just think that there's a little bit more, you see more of at least my experience, right. Was more that conservatives were more apt to spank. And so if you had asked me then I would have been like, oh yeah, you know, children need their ass beat, you know, for all these things. But then as I got older, I started kind of deciding, like, do they, do they really like, is it, do I really need to get upset because he draw on the, he drew on the wall? Um, you know, cause I'm like, isn't that what little boys do? Like they draw on the wall and like, it's just paint. Like I can repaint it, you know, hell he might enjoy repainting it with me. And I would say that's one of my regrets of what I experienced growing up in the very conservative cultures was adherence to rules mm -hmm. with and right. i honestly say that in a lot of ways and this is something that i really appreciated about your response to dave smith when he was talking about cultural conservatism being preferable and i was on the same mindset that you were thinking of in terms mm -hmm. of conservative movement the conservative culture gave us the war against drugs and a sort of you know a move towards a theocratical style government and that mm -hmm. sort of thing where they're imposing culture upon us. Right. And, you know, 
of a lot of the Christians that I knew growing up, they did not have an open mind. They were very stubborn in their way of thinking. They were not open-minded at all. Right. And they really, there was a lot of things that they were teaching their kids that, that to me felt like you're not teaching your kids to be friendly with other people. I mean, I remember, so I was a, uh, what they would call the headbangers growing up in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. I had a hair and into heavy metal. Right. And I remember my friend's mom, parents did not like me because I had long hair mm-hmm. back that, you know, I was just like their kids and their kids like me and we had got along just fine. But because I had long hair, I was deemed unworthy or not desirable. Right. And I'm you know, kind of really plays into the idea of the conservative mindset of, a very narrow outlook on what type of people, what what type of behavior is acceptable. And as it comes to kids, not letting kids be kids. I'm like, you know what? There are times when you've got to give kids a little bit of to be who they are and realize that having fun, that there's not always malice involved when they do silly things. If anything, you're going to look back on a lot of those memories and think, wow, those were the best times to have kids to see them do all kinds of silly stuff that they get to do. Yeah. Yeah, Most of my, most of the things that I redirect my son on, or like he'll come in, like he was in my office earlier and you can't see it because I got the fancy little green screen going on, but I've got like lights and I've got equipment and I've got tables and, you know, all this stuff in here to kind of run my podcast show. And so it is not child friendly in here, but I have determined that my son could, for the most part, go wherever we go. And it's just my job to figure out how can he be there safely. And so I just kept keep an eye on him, make sure if he grabs something that might be dangerous. Like I had a, uh, one of those 36 inch straight edge rulers in here. Cause I was doing some, you know, some work in here, some, making some, some, uh, uh, some changes to, you know, the walls and whatnot, whatever. And he was playing with it. And I was just like, Hey, you know, just, just be careful. Cause he can like swing it around and hit stuff and, and there's stuff that he could break. And I, I'm just like, pay attention to him. Like, you know, but let him, let him have fun with whatever, let him explore. You know, there's a few times where I'll say, oh, you can't have that. That's that, that one's a little, you know, too delicate or whatever. Um, and I, I think it works because he's not usually told no. So he's, you know, it's easier to hear it. I think that's my guess. I don't know, but I think that definitely makes sense. I think um, I was just trying to think of a really good example in which I feel like to really bring home why I feel that at times it's appropriate is uh, I remember one time with my uh, oldest when he was probably about five or six and he was and in, in not to publicly, you know, disrespect or anything, but he's a very he was a very immature kid for his maturity, his development early on. Mm-hmm. And we were out in public someplace. I want to say it was out near the mall or something. And I remember he just could not accept the fact that we weren't going to get him a toy. Mm-hmm. Now you have kids. I think you understand that, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes when dead set on something in their mind, they don't let it go. Right. And it becomes passionate with them. Well, he was really upset that he wasn't getting the toy for whatever reason. And he started throwing in the parking lot right there and he would not let it go so of course our initial response was to try to talk him out of it try to help him understand why he's not getting the toy but it actually escalated yeah i think that almost encouraged he kind of felt like well if i raise my voice louder and get more angry and start kicking and screaming Mm -hmm. then maybe way which at that point we'd already give him multiple verbal and, you know, body language kind of, you know, acknowledgements of, hey, this isn't going to happen. You need to let this go. So when he really th- started throwing the rage, you could even actually see his face was getting re- red and the tears are coming out. That's when I had to smack him on the butt to get his mm-hmm. attention. And I said, this is unacceptable. What you're doing right here, right now. And one thing you'll, and one thing parents know is kids love to have their outbursts the most in public yeah. because they, because they sense that you're less likely to get angry with me because you don't want to make a scene. So if I, I will try to use that as leverage. I'll try to hold it hostage by trying to make you try to be nice to me because you don't want to have to make a scene. Well, that never really bothered me a whole lot. So yeah, my kid threw over a toy. I smacked him on the butt a couple of times in quick succession and got his attention. Right. And then down, talked to him and said, Hey, look, 
we're not going to do this. You understand why you're getting, not getting a toy. You know, if you're going to continue like this, we'll leave. Mm -hmm. That we had, we, you can say all those things and still get a good reaction, but only if they're at that point to where they can hear you. Right. When he was and screaming, he wasn't hearing me. Right. And there was no way. So could some to be devil's advocate could someone argue well you got to simply set him aside and let him calm down you could do that but you're not but all you're doing is is you're just using time and emotion you're not getting his attention now i would argue that's not necessarily bad i can see the benefits of timeouts and walking away but sometimes i think it's important to get their attention in the moment right then and there to establish authority and have them realize hey look you don't get to dictate the terms of this situation, right. which is what you're trying to do. Right. And so in context, I do think that that's appropriate. Again, very limited, very narrow, and for a very specific purpose. And then it has to be coupled with an understanding, a discussion of why that happened to try to avoid it in the future. Because right. like I said, I, I didn't have a habit of spanking my kids. It right. happened, but it wasn't often. And it was always coupled with a conversation an expression of love and understanding of why it happened. Right. Yeah. I think I, I, I think I've limited any kind of physical punishment. You could probably hear him in the background there. I think it's about time for uh, him to get his bath, but um, I think I've limited it to um, matters of safety. Like you mentioned earlier uh, for him or for other people. So he is actually put a bruise on my wife's eye and my grand and grandma's eye from one, I think was an accident. He got, he got a little bit too out of control. Like, you know, he comes in, he's playing with the toy and he's, you know, getting excited and throws it or something like that. And then the other, the other time, I think he was upset and angry and um, he'll get away with hitting me a lot quicker and a lot uh, for a lot longer period of time you know, much easier than he will wife or my mom or, or my mother-in-law. And that's, that's my mom's doing because she was, my mother, my mother was heavily abused. Like most people that say, Oh, this is child abuse. If you spank a kid. And I'm like, wait till you hear some of the stories that my mom had to deal with, because you're going to flip your lid. I don't even know if you have a word in your vocabulary to describe these, if you're calling spanking abuse, Right. And I mean, it was, it was bad, Um, but she decided that she wanted to be different. But the one thing that she was really, really adamant about, and I don't know that I ever really knew the source of it, but she was like, you do not ever hit a woman. And this was something that she drilled in repeatedly. And she would tell me, she, I mean, even when I was like in my early teens, she would be like, don't you ever hit a woman. If you do, don't come home because I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Like literally that's what she would say, right? Like my mom didn't talk like that to me as a rule of thumb, but when it came to talking about, you know, hitting women, you know, or the idea of hitting women and, you know, and, 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 you know, I, I, and I, and I I can, I can say in 43 years, I've, I pinched my sister's nose once. And I think I pulled a girl's hair in fifth grade. And that is the only time that I ever struck a, a, a woman. Right. So she must have done something right there. So, so that carried over with me. So now I look at it and I'm like, you don't hit your mommy. You definitely don't hit your grandma because grandma's like almost 80 years old. And he's getting to the point where he can launch an, a nice heavy toy pretty hard and he could really hurt somebody. So he'll get in trouble for those. He doesn't do it very often. It's very rare. Um, but when he's, there's been a few times where I felt like his safety was of concern. And one time we were in the shower, um, he was, you know, we, we both got in the shower and he was showering and then he just had a meltdown for something. I don't remember what it was. And, and I'm, I'm like trying to talk to him. I'm like, Zach, I'm like, what's going on, buddy? Like, you know, you all right? What, what's going on? You know? And he's just, and, and it, it's, it started out as just like throwing a fit, which is no big deal if he's just yelling, like screaming. Okay. Whatever you know, happens. But then he starts stomping around and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, you're in a wet shower. And the corners we have a lot of nice little sharp corners and i'm like you slip and fall and hurt yourself this could be a very serious trip to the hospital so down came my hand and gave him two swat i think it was two swats quickly on the butt um not super duper hard 
just enough to catch his attention. And then I sat him down and I said, stop, or something like that. And it was enough to de-escalate to the point where he was no longer being a danger in the shower, right? And so to me, like, like, like you said earlier, that moment, I don't really feel bad about. A couple of times where I lost my cool and I yelled at him, yeah, I do feel bad about it, you know, and I, I don't like it, and it, you know. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's just interesting, like, to have this conversation and, and kind of discuss, like, the, the, the terms, the, the conditions. Because to me, I look at it and say, I will smack your hands before I let them get burnt on the stove. And part of that is also because we don't really restrict him. So if he wants to come over to the stove and help, I'm like, again, I'm the parent. If there's a feasible way to do it safely, I'm going to do it. And I've, I mean, he, he's almost three now. So when he was like right about two, we've had him up on the stove and I've got one hand on, one, you know, my hand on, on each one of his hands, holding, you know, the pan and holding, you know, the stir, you know, the spoon or whatever, and showing him how to stir the food in the pan. That's hot. That if he touches, he will get a, he will burn his hands. You know, so to me, I'm like, you can come over here, but we're going to be very strict on the rules at this point because we don't have a lot of room for error here. You know, and then there's some things where he just doesn't get to touch at all, like the table saw, you know, like there's, there's no touching the table saw, period. Not when it's off, just not at all. Right. It's stuff like that. But, but because I, but, but I feel like because we're introducing him and allowing him so much freedom that one, it requires more out of me because I need to be more mindful. But then also um, when it comes to matters of safety, we need him to listen sooner than later. So. Right. I think, and I think we're mostly in agreement. I would even go so far as to say that anyone who does peaceful parenting and advocates for it, I have no problem with it. To me, it does not really, it's not in conflict with my approach because I kind of feel like, as I said before, too many parents are, for lack of a better word, lazy in their approach. Yes. They don't put it or thought into their approach and they rely on spanking and physical violence as opposed to teaching and training their kids properly. Right. That to me is a real problem. So yes. I don't, I don't have a problem with peaceful parenting at all, only to the extent that I would say that when the subject of abuse comes up and whether it qualifies as abuse, um, I think that's a discussion that can be had because I will say that I do believe words matter and I also believe motivation matters. I right. don't believe that spanking a child's butt to get their attention is abuse because abuse is meant with malice and that's right. not meant with meant with love. Right. You know, it's when you make a decision for your child in love, but it turns out to be the wrong decision. You know, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that, but that's, we don't, wouldn't call that necessarily abuse either. So I right. think we have to be careful about the terms that we're using and the context in which we're going to apply them. So for me, if a child never gets spanked, I don't think it's necessarily a problem at all. And I'm sure you can be very successful with it. I just don't like the idea of dismissing or labeling people who do use a measured amount of um, physical punishment or discipline as abuse, because I feel like that denotes a, um, a bad motive, which is not necessarily true or right. accurate. I feel that as libertarians of people who are going to be th thoughtful, we have to be open-minded to that sort of mm -hmm. approach versus my approach and have a g give a good faith effort to reasoning from one another side about why right. do you do this is what I do. Right. Because, you know, I, again, I hold no ill will. I just don't feel, I do feel that there's a place for it. It's very limited, but there is a place for it. Right. And so someone can demonstrate peaceful parenting in such a way that I feel that it really gets the results. Great. But it's not, I mean, honestly, we're thinking of a, uh, you know, a society in which very few people even consider liberty to begin with. I don't think too many people are going to be, go that extra mile to consider peaceful parenting. It's noble. Right. I don't think too far fetched to consider but I think it's just one of those things. I think it's almost a novelty in my opinion, yeah. because 
we're trying to get people to just consider peaceful living in society. Right. <laughs> I mean, so we can't get them to stop, you know, sending people to war, you know, exactly. and I'm like, we, you know, like we're, you know, we live in a, a country where the idea of sending people off to a foreign war is like, yeah, that's what we do. You know, we, we send people off and, you know, they might get blown up and we're going to be very sad about it, but we're going to keep doing it and then turn around and say, but you know, you should never hit your kids. And I'm like, <laughs> like, so it's like but, when we're sharing the, the message of liberty with other people, it's definitely, oh, everything's game. Everything's on the table. But right. I don't think it's one of my priorities. I think there's a lot of other things I share with people to consider before we get into that aspect. Right. I think that's going to, it's going to be kind of like a lot of us, anar you know, argue anarchy versus menarchy. And, and you know, it's kind of my, my thing is like this, I'm an anarchist in principle. And I believe that's absolutely the most consistent and logical destination. Do I think we're going to get there in my lifetime? No. But if we get to the point to where we can make the gut, the state so insignificant that we can flirt with anarchy. Absolutely. Right. But let's just point first. Right. And so as a, I want people just to consider the idea of thinking at life in general differently then we can discuss how we parent. Although I will right. say teaching kids to think differently mm -hmm. is a big deal. Getting yep. kids to challenge conventional wisdom to think critically and to reconsider the conventional wisdom that they're taught in schools is absolutely imperative. And I think when it comes to like, you know, the whole Liberty Dad concept, that is huge. I've got my kid already understanding why taxation is theft. He already right. understands the problems of socialism. He understands what it means to be unpopular in a group of people who all want the same thing. So if he's right. already learned lessons that I never got growing up. So right. in that, there's an all encompassing sort of mindset that goes into that. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I, I, I think this is one of the, you know, like you can take some, how we communicate this idea of peaceful parenting, whatever that looks like. And we can say, there are parallels to how we communicate liberty as well. Because when I first was introduced to peaceful parenting, it was not in a peaceful way. People were vicious. I remember one dude, we were connected on Facebook and he had posted a link to a, like a news article or something. And it said, you know, new study or some study um, finds that kids that get spanked um, or less something or whatever, you know, it was, you know, made some assertion about what happens to kids that get spanked. And I was like, well, I was very curious and I was a bit skeptical because I was like, this runs counter to like everything I've observed with like thousands of people. Right. And so I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read the study. So I went and I read the study. I mean, I, I was able to find it and I read it and I, and it wasn't very long. And I, I came back and I said, you know, I disagree with some things that are being presented from this study. And, you know, here's why. And at first the conversation was fine. It was just kind of like, oh, well, why do you think this? And I was like this, blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden that conversation turned at a moment. And I don't know why. I never did figure out why. And all I was disagreeing with was what are the results um, that we've identified from spanking? And I said, I don't think the study is saying uh, I think that there are some some problems, some some arguments to be had, and that we can't just you know say, oh, it's kind of like the whole will squelch their personality kind of a thing, you know, if we spank them, kind of, you know, and and it would put it for every one of them. And I said there are some questions there, like on how they the study defines spanking, what it included, this you know, like this kind of stuff. And he just ripped into me, and you know, told me I was a child abuser and all this stuff. I'm not, I'm like. I, I, <laughs> And, and then he like blocked me on Facebook, but not before sending me a message direct, you know, a direct message, you know, telling me I was just like some effing, you know, child beater upper kind of, you know, and I'm like, dude, I never even said whether I think that spanking is a good idea. We never even had that part of the conversation. All I said was, I don't think the study shows what you think it shows. And I've had, I, I've, that, that was the worst one, but I've had some other ones where it gets really heated really quickly. And I'm like, look, maybe some of you peaceful parents need to learn how to be peaceful adults because you're not very convincing. 100%. You know, and, and I feel like 
I feel like when, when we do that, we're not hearing the concerns that people have. Cause the biggest concern I've always heard is if you don't spank a kid, they'll grow up to be, you know, um, a, 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 a very whiny, um, selfish child, blah, blah. And so what people are expressing is I would rather smack my kid than to know that they're going to grow up to be some spoiled brat that thinks that they're entitled to, to everything from everyone. And I'm well, like, and there's neither. Cool. I would say that as far as I say, again, merely spanking your kid does not automatically translate to wisdom being passed on. <laughs> right. And I right. think people who assume whether it's through movies and culture or something else that beating the shit out of your kid automatically means your kids can be like, Oh, wow. I really see the light now. No, right. there's right. That's not how it works. You yeah. know, you've gotten the, for the moment to in which you can impart wisdom right. and share, a, but you're physic physically hitting your kid does nothing for them in terms of understanding. It's merely getting right. their attention, establishing a boundary or right. a no go. All it's doing. Yeah, and, and I, I think, think we need to. I th I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I think we need to like if we're going to promote this less hitting, whatever that means, whether it's entirely like zero or whether it's like very very minimal. I think it's up to us to kind of deal with the concerns that people have. Cause I think they're real honest concerns. I mean, nobody's like, I got to spank my kid because how else will I ever let my anger out? They're like, I need to spank my kid because I don't want them to grow up to be a terrible person. And I'm like, well, that, that's well, an admirable goal. Even if it's not really, you know, like even if they, we need to work them through why that won't necessarily happen. God, it's the same mindset that people have as to why we need government. They think, well, we right. need government to enforce these million and one different laws, because the government and the police don't enforce these millions, countless laws, then society is going to, you know, go into chaos. Right. And well, is it possible that free people can interact with each other and reason with each other in peace? Is it possible that we can live peacefully without millions of laws and have right. boundaries established? And, you know, it's, it's, it's these people automatically what they're taught is for the societal structure. They think that translates to how they raise their kids as well. Right. I don't think that's any coincidence by any measure either, but I will say that into what you were discussing with having a conversation, I think there are some people that can take it to the opposite side to where they say peaceful parenting hands off, but they will almost go unleashed with their tongue right. and they will things verbally and in my opinion, are abusive, but they might feel, well, as long as I'm not laying a hand on you, I'm okay. Well, that's actually not true. Right. You can act from a child with verbal abuse. And yeah. I, I, again, the, my, my biggest, my most regrettable moments with my kids are with how I've expressed my anger with them more right. so thanking them ever mm -hmm. without a doubt. I think that applies to people as well as you have to be careful how you speak to people because that can be abuse and then right. it's that worse than physical abuse right so oh yeah my my ex-wife it's interesting she uh i don't think her uh you know I'd be very careful here on how much i divulge but i don't think that she ever got a spanking from her dad but i know that i remember um you know hearing stories about stuff that she heard her dad say and this wasn't even said directly to her that just basically said, I have no confidence in you, in who you are, you know, and, and even though it wasn't said directly to her, that actually might have made it worse, is that, you know, if I, if I were to say something mean spirited to my son, I might be able to come back later and say, son, I was just lost my temper. And, he, you know, he might be willing to believe me. But if he hears me behind his back, telling you know his mom something about him you know like oh he's a, he'll never be smart you know like you don't you don't really get to say oh i was frustrated that day or you know what i mean like so i think that i think that in the long run kids remember that and they take it more to heart and i think that you know this even though even though he didn't say anything he wasn't like you know you terrible kid you or whatever and he didn't say it, it was still verbal abuse even though it wasn't direct to her and it wasn't using you know, strong language of any kind, you know, it was still expressing, you know, and I don't know if maybe abuse is quite the, the right word. I hate using the same word for everything, 
but I, but I do think it was a problem. And I think the words that we say could actually be a, a problem long before simple spanking, simple spanking, of course. I mean, well, I, well, when we were discussing earlier about the problems of conservative culture, you just kind of reminded me of something about that in regards to, you know, I remember families that would actually use isolation as punishment for their kids. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, having talked to some people that I knew that went through some of these different, and I would say, I don't know if they were necessarily practicing peaceful parenting as opposed to just different techniques. Right. But I can tell you a lot of techniques that parents have used, such as isolation, such as uh, being cut off from other friends and family that are every bit as harmful as a spanking or oh, any yeah. other kind of punishment. So it's like, got to be careful that we're, not assuming that simply being hands off means it's okay. And I think right. that's where I don't presume that everybody's advocating for that, but I think we have to be careful not to go so far in that other direction right. that we simply not using our hands means we're what we're in the right. Well, no, you can actually harm a child without ever laying a hand them on them right. simply by the way them. And I would say over the course of these last two years, We've all heard the stories of what parents have done to their kids out of fear of getting sick and the way that they've harmed them through isolation in different ways that are absolutely terrible. Yeah. Do you so see what I posted last night? I think it was last <laughs> night. Um, I saw Tom Woods had retweeted something where it was a doctor. And um, I don't remember exactly what the doctor said, but they had like toward the end, they were expressing like their son or their child um, got sick. And they wouldn't want to be in the same room with them. And I was yeah. like, I was like, what? You know, of course, Tom Woods, he takes, you know, he takes aim at that. And he's like, you know, all my children, he's like, I will always be there for you. And I was like, like, this literally just happened um, to us where my son got sick. He actually has been sick more than once because he's a toddler, but he got sick recently, like a week and a half ago. And he wanted more attention, right? He's sick. He wants to cuddle up, whatever. So that's what he got. And um, I would go into his room and, and stay in his room with him. You know, like he's, he doesn't have a, uh, like a car bed that's, you know, child size. He has like a twin bed. So, um, so there's plenty of room for mom or dad to be in there with him. And so I would like, all right, well, you know, if he's, you know, he's not feeling well, so he's going to get a little extra attention. So I would lay down with him. Sometimes I would take a nap with him to help him, you know, feel a little bit more comfortable and more comforted. And um, sure enough, he would cough in my face, right? Like, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not, not even three yet. And I was like, that's the way it is. And I got sick, um, <laughs> you know, and actually this is probably the sickest that I've been in quite some time, you know, and, and I didn't particularly care for it, but I'm like, I have no regrets for doing that. I'm like, this is your, this is your child. Like, you know, you're, you're, I mean, there may be a time and a place to isolate a little bit and say, okay, maybe mommy's going to take care of you right now or whatever, you know? So I, I think there are times and places for it, but overall, like, you know, uh, if it's just a cold or the flu, yeah, but, well, I'll just deal with it and it won't be pleasant if I get it, but, and it wasn't, we just, by the way. <laughs> From the liberty perspective, you're you're having to do life thoughtfully, and you have to do parenting thoughtfully. Right. And I will just, you know, the churches that I've attended and currently attend, they're predominantly conservative mm -hmm. churches people, and it's still to this day. I it just it never ceases to amaze me that people are still stuck in a very particular mindset. Right. They really are, and um, you know. If I were to ever, every now and then, I try to drop a little bit of a hint of a, you know, uh, a different perspective on things. And, you know, one thing is for certain is, you know, we're living in a culture to where certain people just do what they've been taught from growing up in a certain way. They don't challenge it. They don't question it. There's mm -hmm. not enough critical thinking. And I really think that that's one of the biggest issues that I see with parenting as well is there's just not enough critical thinking of, is there a better way to do this? Right. You know, same yeah. way that they don't have life that way. They don't think, is there a better way to do life than what we're doing? And they don't think they don't apply that to parenting either because 
they just view it as I'm the parent, it's my right, now I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I'm like, well, that's in the easy way to get out of that. But that's really not very thoughtful. And honestly, that doesn't come from a perspective of love. That's right. a perspective of selfishness. That's it's very you authoritarian. Saying, Yes, you're going to do what's you're going to do what you want to do. And that's the same way that you approach culture is you want what you want, regardless of what is good for anybody else. And right. so I don't think it's a surprise when people who apply conventional wisdom to society apply very conventional wisdom to parenting mm -hmm. to where they blindly hit their kids and abuse their kids often because that's how they were treated or that's what they know. And right. they don't and they bothered to think things through. Um, I won't mention anyone I know personally, but I will say that there are people that I know in my personal circle that I can tell that when it comes to how they treat their children, there's not a whole lot of for, you know, uh, deeper consideration for the things that they do. They're mm -hmm. just really on very default mechanisms and behaviors. Right. And it bothers me. It really does. It's right. not my peak out. But it does bother me. And I just realize, at least on my part, I'm trying to do what I can to reevaluate just as often as possible and reconsider how am I treating my kids and, you know, right. and, and my adults that I want. And, you know, I just know that from about five or six years ago with my oldest, when I really started making a more intentional effort to be less angry, to be more, to be less of the military type that I needed mm -hmm. and that he needed, that's when everything changed. That's right. when I started a better result from him. And I realized, wow, this kid, he's smart. He understands what I'm telling him. I don't need to threaten him or intimidate him or yell at him. I can right. just treat him like a better results. And okay. I just wish parents were going to be a little bit more thoughtful because I would argue most parents want to do better. Mm -hmm. Most are probably aware of the mistakes that they've made. And at some point or another, they're probably thinking about or reflecting on a time where they've had an interaction with their kid that they knew that they were wrong and they probably regret it, but they don't have a clues to what they do or how to do it better. Right. And I think there's a lot of, yeah, I think there's a lot of, it's just the way it is. Exactly. Kind of thinking. Like, well, it's just the way it is. I can't change anything. And I'm like, you can. Uh, it does, like you said, it requires more thought. And sometimes sometimes it requires getting some advice from somebody. And I think that's where people like, say, you and I have an opportunity to say, make sure that it counts. And this is why I really oppose this idea of like saying, oh, well, if you spank your kid, it's abuse. It's just child abuse. And I'm like, do you really think that I like like you might shock some parents into deciding not to spank their kids, but you're still not like you're doing exactly what they're not doing. You're not addressing the core issue. The core issue, like you said earlier, is not that a child wants to misbehave. They're just going to do things for whatever reason. Maybe they don't know any better. Maybe it looks fun, right? Like simple enough fun, you know, whatever. And I think that, you know, the peaceful parents, the, the parents that want to, have an impact on other parents need to communicate the ideas in a way that makes people go, you know what? That's a good idea. And I'll give you a good example. Jordan Peterson, I heard a video, I saw a video one time. I don't remember even why I was watching the video, but he, uh, he was talking about his son and he said when his son would misbehave, he would have him sit on the edge of the stairs, like at the bottom of the stairs and be like, you calm down. When you calm down, you come back out, right? You just, you just sit here and just, just chill, just, just relax. And when his son would calm down, he would come back out, maybe to the dinner table or whatever it is that the family was doing. And he said, we were done. He was done. I was done. We didn't bring it up. So none of this, like, Oh, you decide you're going to be good now. Kind of just like, you know, and, and, and that had a profound impact on me just hearing it that way. And so I remember when my son, like I said earlier, my son would, you know, we might put him in his room to let him calm down. When he comes out, he's got something in his hand, a car or something. He's like, dad, I got a car. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, nothing ever happened. And I'm like, I'm going to go with it. Like he seems to be in a happy, you know, disposition at this point. Um, unless we want unless we're going to sit down and talk about it. There's no reason to even worry about it. Just move on, you know? And, you, you know, and, and so I feel like that's, 
that's our opportunity to really communicate in a way that makes people say, you know what, I really, I want that too. You know, I, because for me, one of the reasons that I do it is I'm like, I, I don't feel good about yelling at my son or the very few times that he's had, you know, like a swat on the hands or something like that. I don't like that. I would much rather see him running around with a dinosaur in his hand, you know, playing and having fun or coming outside with me and working with some tools or helping me paint the wall or, you know, whatever it is, you know, I, I, I would much rather have fun experiences. And so to me, the way to enjoy more experiences is to find ways to not be in a state of anger. You know, this is one of the reasons why I said earlier, I just look at a lot of stuff and I'm like, yeah, that's what little boys do. Uh, you know, no reason to be upset about that. Like they, they ride on walls. I'm going to tell them no. And I'm going to maybe take the crowns and say, come over here and sit down and draw on the paper, you know, but I'm not going to get out, throw a big fuss about it because I expect some things to happen. And so there's no reason to be angry and, and, and have that. And once he gets angry, well, hell, the situation's lost because it takes him a while to calm down. I will say that I can definitely relate to the idea of wanting to find a positive way to convey the message that makes it more appealing. Um, I do think that no matter what, there's always going to be room for a better example. And I do think that um, what we're seeing right now coming from the left in terms of giving the kids too much leeway, mm -hmm. um, definitely think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for improving parenting, you know, right. even if it's not from the peaceful parenting perspective, just the idea of giving your kids guidance, you know, reinforce right. the parental role in guiding and developing a child is just massive right now because right. there's too many people that are teaching your kids for are from an early age should have more say over their own life. And, you know, as much as I do agree that you have to teach your kid to be a critical thinker and make decisions for themselves, you're still the parent. You're still in charge. Right. You have to give, they're still developing and learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's an opportunity to get their attention by reinforcing what they know to be true in terms of traditional parenting still has a role in the sense of you have a responsibility to be involved. But let's take that and do it in a healthy way. Right. Let's not back to the 1950s of I'll beat your ass if you don't do exactly what I say when I say, right. you know, there's a lot of room to go from one side to the other and say, we're not going to let our kids have their way all the time, but we're certainly not going to start beating the crap out of them every time that they say a stray word or don't exactly do what we tell them to do. So there's definitely an opportunity. There's definitely an open market, you know for reinforcing the idea of parenting of parents having a strong role in their kids lives and i think that's definitely going to be a bridge for libertarians to cross to get them to say hey look you know if you really want to have a role in your kids lives and if you're tired of you know media school and other sources you know poisoning your kids minds with all these you know radically different ideas that in some way are very harmful you know Here's an opportunity to find common ground and say, you know, you should have a role, but oh, by the way, here's a really good way to do it. Here's right. a way that you know, teaches them to be, you know, strong, independent thinkers and not rely on authority figures. And it kind of honestly, it goes back to, you know, there used to be a very popular meme amongst a lot of conservatives where they would talk about their daughters and say, if you're going to date my daughter, here are the rules or else. Right. And then, you shortly thereafter another you know meme came around and said well if you raise your daughters right you don't have to worry about that right and it, it applies to kids you know teach your kids the fundamentals from an early on and you don't have to worry about what kind of garbage the world's going to throw at them and right. that's right good about my kids is you know i took that approach i and i was very intentional in trying to teach my kids here's what's right and here's what's wrong and do you understand why not right. me merely telling you, but do you understand it and right. ensuring back and forth that thinking involved, yeah. so, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of common ground that can be had. And I think that, you know, I, oddly enough, society is presenting us with that if we can take advantage of it. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think that 
I, I think once we work out how to deliver the message, it, I don't think it's actually that hard to deliver it. I think it's just really a matter of tapping into what p- most parents probably want, which is to have a good, you know, generally good experience um, on the regular basis with their children, right? Like that's really what they want. Um, I know that not every experience will always be pleasant. There will be times they're sick, they're throwing a fit, you know, they're being stubborn, you know, so, so I, I get that, you know, but we don't have to, we don't have to dread those moments, nor do we have to necessarily approach them in an angry state. We can just approach it and say, okay, it is what it is because my God, they are three. That's what they do. They, they're going to have an emotional outbreak and they're going to be totally irrational because they are three. And it's okay. And I'm just here to contain it enough so that nobody gets hurt. And then once they calm down, we'll resume, right? We'll, yeah. you know, and, and if we need to have a conversation, if we need to talk about maybe why they shouldn't throw their toy at grandma or something like that, right? Then yes, we can have that conversation. But it doesn't necessarily have to be escalated any more than it already is. You know, I think that would be very appealing, much more appealing than saying, if you spank your kid, you're abusive. And, and I've heard people say that, like, like, like just all spanking, like period, end of story. It doesn't matter what the reason is. They just rule it all out. And I'm like, I don't know that, like, that would have not have appealed to me five years ago, like for sure. Well, and it doesn't like, appeal to me now, but. Well, it's kind of like, so you and I came from the military background, you know, the, you know, conservative background in the early 2000s. We remember what it was like when the certain independents or anti-war types were talking about how, oh, you just want blood for oil. You know, right. you just, all you dominating the world or policing the world. All these different tropes that we just like, we genuinely did not agree with. Even if we were misguided, we did not believe in, hey, we're fighting for oil or we're fighting to dominate the Arab culture and all this other stuff. We didn't buy into that. We right. drew, genuinely believed that there was this boogeyman that threatened our way of life right we wanted to now having said that once that bubble was broken and we understood how misguided we were in our approach then we could consider other possibilities and realize oh so there's a lot more going on here than just what i was thinking but also it's not what you were telling me either and i think that as well is you know, there's a right way and a wrong way to go about this. And it doesn't really even really matter what your approach is, is it are you being open minded? And are you thinking critically? And are you really considering this from a good faith perspective? Are you trying to have an honest and reasonable conversation? Because honestly, it's a, it's a sort of, a, you have to get a person to buy in and listen and to really consider you can't get that if all you're saying is you're a bad person and you're wrong. Right. Well, you're not not going to get anybody to consider what you say. And libertarians have a tendency to be that way sometimes. I right. mean, you know, I probably would have been a libertarian a lot sooner if it were not for the Paul bots of, you know, 2008 and 2009, because they were very aggressive and they were very, you know, bombastic in their approach. And, right. I, and that really off. So I would just say that there's definitely a good conversation to be had about parenting skills, approaches, mm-hmm. you know, good, what's bad. But ultimately, if you can't get people to consider it with an open mind because you're constantly telling them that they're wrong or they're stupid, well, then that conversation is never going to take place. Right. We got we, that- we, we got to get people to want it. Like like people should want what we have, whether it's you know the the relationship that we have with our children, or whether it's this confidence in a, a world that's radically different you know, where there's little or no government, you know, you know, whomever, you know, wherever we stand on that matter. Like to me, it's all, it's not much different than my son. I want him to want to be a certain way because it's appealing because he's like, yeah, this, you know, uh, I would rather be this way to mommy and daddy because I personally enjoy it more right? I find it more valuable to me. And I feel the same way about libertarianism, right? So you come from an evangelical background. Well, so do I. 
well, what you just said right there, is that not what we hear in church all the time? Right. We want people to want what we have. We want people to see us and think, wow, these people are living differently. They have a different, you know, they're happy. They seem like there's a, there's a goodness about their life. We should want them to want what we have. And I'm like, well, that, you know, it's the same thing as you have to live those principles. Right. If you're going to church and you're nodding your head, to the idea of living a certain way. But then as soon as you leave church, you live completely different in opposition to everything right. that's just, and you're just, you go on about your daily business, like the normal asshole that you are. Well, then of course, nobody's going to want what you want because right. you're not. Exactly like that. And right. so as liberty of expressing the message, if you approach people in a very negative and hostile manner hey man you should want what we want because we've got the solutions for your life and if you don't like it well then you suck and you're evil well right. <laughs> is yeah. that appeal right yeah I, I i don't think that's appealing and um it seems almost contradictory in a sense you know because it's like it, it kind of comes across as uh, not not very a different flavor of authoritarianism like exactly you have to have what i have otherwise well, you're a terrible person and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, if nothing more ridicule, you, ridicule you and make you feel bad, which I don't find is, you know, I mean, it's, it's a step away, I guess, from, you know, taking a more authoritative measure to force somebody. Um, but all right. So man, we're, we're up at about a, a hour and 16 minutes. It's been a good conversation. I don't want to hold you up too long. Any final words? Not at all. I think we hashed it all out. I think, you know, we uh, found the, you know, the common link between, you know, libertarians and libertarians and parenting, you know, just requires being open minded and being thoughtful. And I think that if you can have that as a starting point, the possibilities are endless. You just got to get to that point first. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, this has been a great conversation. And um, I think that's all that I have. So folks, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, make sure you uh, make sure you can find uh, Brian Fox on um, you're on Twitter. I know you are um, bourbon kind of snob, bourbon snob. That's it. Yeah. So <laughs> bourbon snob. So go look him up. He's he's actually a pretty good guy. He's not too snobby. So I think you'll enjoy him. So with that, uh, we're out. Thanks, everyone. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter or send me an email to libertydadpodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. To catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode airs Monday night at 8 p.m. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Prefer an audio format? Then head on over to libertydad.com or just search for Liberty Dad, all one word, on your favorite podcast app. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.